Good as tea. How are ye? Welcome back to the Candlelit Tales podcast, where we tell stories from Irish mythology and chat about them afterwards. In this series, The Tone Mosaic, we are telling the tone from different character perspectives. We are joining this story as the Army of Connacht crosses into Ulster. And if you're feeling a bit lost when I say that, you might try going back to the beginning of this series and picking up with Fergus McRoy in episode number 230. This podcast is brought to you by our supporters at Patreon. You can join them over at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales, or you can make a one-time donation using the PayPal button on our website. Like, share, comment, and above all, enjoy. And now, we're going to tell you a story. It's not funny anymore. It's not fun. It was at first. The day before yesterday when we crossed the border. Most of the houses were empty. Some of the animals were still there. Everyone was laughing and singing. Driving off cattle. Talking about how wealthy we all are now. How we're going to go home and live like kings. And there wasn't any fighting. Not even the kind that you do with hurleys instead of swords. But then... We saw that tree. All the trees are bare. It's winter. But that tree had twisted branches... With huge fruit in them. It was so strange to look at. It looked like something out of the other world. And then I looked at it, really looked at it closely, and I wish I hadn't. Because they weren't branches, they were roots. Someone pulled an oak tree out of the ground and turned it upside down so that the roots were waving in the sky and those fruits were not fruit. They were the heads of warriors. Perched in the roots, staring at us with dead eyes. And the only bright thing was the blood dripping. I've never seen anything like that. I've never heard a story of anything like that. I don't know what kind of person could do something like that, but... It's not a person that everyone's afraid of. It's not because of a person that it feels like the night is full of terror now. It's not fun anymore. We're packed in too close. People are restless, arguing. The fires are too close together. There's no room, but no one wants to go away. No one wants to be outside, alone, in the dark. The nights are too long, with only the fire between us and the dark, and the thing in the dark, the hound. cold wind blew. All of the men and women huddled around fires, pulling cloaks around them, bearing skin only of their hands to the flame. 
Bright sparks lit up the night sky. Dark clouds overhead. Huddled faces behind cloth could be seen peering out. Wide eyes, all looking in terror at one another. Huddled close, waiting, watching. Whispered conversations. Ferdia was in the middle, in the midst. His hard, horned skin, no protection from the cold, as he shivered, feeling grim, near sad, for many had lost their lives already, marching into an Ulster undefended. The drums had rang out the first night they had sang and driven off so much. They thought it was easy. Where had he been, he thought. He was supposed to be at the border. Why wasn't he there waiting? But he'd come. He'd come the next night. When the dark descended. Stones came first. They didn't know what to expect and so men, brave, foolish men, took up their arms and went out. They didn't come back. Their bodies were found. So. More of them started to go off in bigger groups. Till they found the tree. Maybe it was worse. The sons of Nera, sure enough. Every limb stuck fast but the sons of Garak. And their three charioteers that really placed a fear on everyone there. They'd gone out with weapons, you see, normally charioteers are protected. Maybe they won't be killed in combat. But no, they'd taken their weapons so Ku would kill them. They should have known. The headless bodies of the three charioteers and three warriors that the sons of Garak sent back to strike fear into this army. Ferdia looked straight into the fire and he heard the quiet, huddled whispers, descriptions of the great fangs, the fearsome claws, the agile hound the monster that was attacking them ten feet tall they said and he must be he must be that size that fierce the hound of Ulster Fergus described him alright didn't describe what he looked like for he almost smiled to remember the seven lights shining out of his eyes was three colours in his hair. Soft fingers, seven of them on each hand. He nearly smiled. But to think of the hound of Cullen running around outside for three days and three nights. It wasn't a laughing matter. And he might be called on any day now. As the great warriors were showing their strength. He looked across to see the bare chest of the hairy man Nathcran Tail sitting by the fire, sharpening poles and sticks into spears. Head down, eyes cast. Round another fire he saw a whole bloodline. The wizards, the sorcerer, the famous Calathan and his twenty-seven sons and sisters' sons, all there, all bowed down, cloaks around them, whispering quietly, calling up some form of magic, no doubt. Eeriness surrounded them. Freyk, the beautiful, 
sharp sword by his side, out of its sheath, gleaming in the firelight, close beside him, just in case. Just in case any stones came flying out from the darkness around them. They were huddled in, so close, so tense, so full of fear. And then he looked up, and for he saw a man running across. He was a charioteer, he thought. Sticks in his hand, straight into Maeve's tent. He wondered. Olia looked up to see a man enter into their tent. A man by the name of Orlam, a charioteer who claimed he'd seen the first sight of this hound, this fearsome warrior, this monster that was destroying this army's will keep on pillaging. The description Orlam gave him was not best pleasing. He was not ten feet tall or six feet wide. He did not have claws or sharp savage teeth. This hound was a boy, he said. A boy. Oh, little scoffed. Surely there's one man out there that'll have courage enough to face a boy and put some manners on him, he thought. Who would it be, though? At the same time, around a different fire, Fergus warmed his hands, his eyes looking at his scabbard, the empty scabbard. He'd carved a fake sword from a great branch that had fallen so he could place it in the sheath so no one would know he did not have his great sword, Leocon, without which he would not want to face any of the Ulstermen and certainly not Cú Cullen, not now that he's had the taste of blood not know that he's doing such a good job of instilling fear amongst this army. And he's killed every faction, every fighting group that have gone out against him. He's killed so many. And as Fergus looked at the pale, long, stern face, framed in red hair, a face he'd they're fallen fully in love with, but it was so cold, so harsh, so stern. Maeve looked at him expectantly. What was he to do? There was nothing to do. Not why Cú Cullen was out around them. The Queen called on me just now to attend her. They were arguing again. The Queen and her consort and the Queen and her general who's also her consort. I don't have an opinion about that but she has a plan. She's going to send the general, Fergus to talk to the monster. And they're going to make an agreement. I feel easier knowing that she has a plan. She always knows what she's doing. I never know what's going to happen next. But it's good. It's good to have a queen who does. And a general who does. Because if they have a plan, then the rest of us are safe. I think I must have looked scared still, though, because the Queen was kind to me. She smiled at me. She said if I still wanted to, 
tomorrow, I can wear her gold headdress. <laughs>